You kind of imagine, you know, people hustling and bustling off the train from work. Greensboro's brewery scene has become quite vibrant. Isn't that pretty? But it took a while to get here. The um, earliest we found, because this is still active research for us, was in 1829 in Greensboro's first town census. It started with saloons. Uh, saloons were places where um, blue collar workers, working class would come together. Richard Cox of the well-crafted NC project says that first census showed the city's population was fewer than 500 people, but they were served by five stores and three saloons. We found some from 1850s, the 1870s, and then it sort of explodes at that point. By 1899, Cox says there were 10 to 15 saloons just on Elm Street. You would go in, um, there would be a long bar at the end. There would say, usually the floor would be, there would be sometimes like sawdust for when people have spills and that sort of thing. Hotels also had saloons inside them with most of them centered around the railroad tracks. That was our main street. There is the tracks there, which that means there's travelers. It also means that's where people are leaving work and they're going to congregate there. The projects found more than 30 saloons from the first up until 1908 when North Carolina passed prohibition. And there were some people being misled, they feel, and that a lot of people who voted for prohibition thought beer was going to be excluded. Some of the saloon owners were forced to adjust when an exemption was passed allowing gentlemen's clubs, but those were voted on every couple years and the next vote came and they were forced to close. Then you've had these gentlemen clubs that are closing, which feeds right into speakeasies and blind tigers. When prohibition ended, the beer scene was slow to restart. It wasn't until the 60s that the brewing culture kicked in. Budweiser was looking at building in Greensboro, but it never happened. And Schlitz, of course, ended up building the largest brewery ever at that point in Winston-Salem. And then later in Eden, uh, Miller opened a, um, a large brewery. In the then in the 80s came the crafts. Being kind of on that upward trend, as you mentioned, you know, saloons to brothels, to speakeasies, whatever else, it's invigorating. Little Brother Brewing is housed inside what used to be the C.C. Schaffner Saloon, then the J.R. Stewart Saloon. There's this like creepy hallway between us and McCole's. I, I literally, I call it the creepy hallway because it is kind of creepy. It's like really unfinished, really narrow. When they first moved in, they even found pre-prohibition bottles in the basement. Because that kind of was one of those moments whenever I realized this place has a ton of history. Across the street, Natty Greens is in what used to be the R.P. Goral Saloon. You just walk down South Elm Street, you'll see like old bank vaults or saloon, you know, pieces or times of history in the area. And you don't really acknowledge or realize how far back it does go. On the other side of the tracks sits what was once the Cascade Saloon. Now it's the Christman Company, but much of what was still is. And they all make great beer and they all celebrate different aspects of brewing, you know, and they're all very different, which is exciting. Even the F.W. Woolworth store, the site of the sit-ins, was once the Benbow House Bar inside the Guilford Benbow Hotel. The brewery community is so inviting. It's very welcoming. Um, a lot of co-opetition. We're all kind of helping lift each other up. While the saloons were once considered taboo, depending on people's beliefs, <laughs> these breweries are now seen as anchors. They're community hubs. They give you like that little insight to that piece of the community. And if history teaches us anything, the slow restart after prohibition is further insight into just how important it is to pour support into these small businesses as they push through the pandemic.